Over the next couple weeks, I'll be interviewing some of the best brands in the e-commerce space, grabbing some incredible stories, some incredible advice, some incredible perspective, all centered around e-commerce, around product, around branding, and a lot of other amazing topics. So if you wanna keep up to date with what take metrics is doing, and if you wanna keep up to date with these incredible brand interviews that are on the way, make sure you subscribe to keep up to date with the latest. In this initial episode of our brand interview series, I'm gonna be talking with Greg, the inventor of the cap rack. His story is incredible. The story behind the cap rack is incredible, as well as all of his other products. Let's jump into this conversation with Greg about product innovation, product development, and his incredible story. What's up, everyone? I got Greg on the line today. Greg is here with us, and I'm actually really excited for, for this recording, for this interview. Let's talk about the beginning, because that's where I want to want to start the conversation with how you got started. Because this this the context for this discussion is about product. It's about innovation. It's about developing a good product that people want to buy. But let's go way back to the beginning with how you even got started. You said you started in your twenties. So what what did that look like? How did you even get into the game? You know, like so many people out there with a crazy idea, uh, you know, necessity was the mother of invention for me. You know, we'll go back to when I was in college and back then baseball caps, that's where our company started, all came flat. The visors were flat. Nowadays, you'll buy a hat and it'll be curved. Back then, every hat was flat. And as a young boy, traditionally, you had to Put the right curve in it and there are lots of different methods people would put a baseball and then wrap up a, a rubber band uh people used a soup can now it had to be the right soup can what was the soup what was the right soup can it was a progresso it was a little bigger okay, okay. not a campbell's you know those are much <laughs> okay. smaller um so everyone had a different way and i had a different way and of course you know one day i just said you know there's got to be a better way than all these homemade contraptions and you know, that that was the genesis of what became my first product, which we called the Perfect Curve Cap Curve. The actual product was, was this here. This came out back in uh, the early 90s, and it started as a piece of Play-Doh. Now, I didn't have an engineering degree. I wasn't an artist. I didn't have anything like that, but I could visualize what I wanted the product to be. So I actually, the only way I could do it was to mold it out of something I could buy for $3. And I created a prototype and I showed it to my father, who was a businessman. I showed it to my mom and they thought I was crazy. They're like, you're nuts. We just spent all this money for you to graduate college and you're playing with Play-Doh. And I said, no, but I'm not the only one. There's other people out there that need to curve their caps. And you know, that just kind of steamrolled and I stuck to my guns and I did my research and I showed my dad, again, a businessman that, you know, we could possibly make money at it. And, you know, lo and behold, the end result was this little device here. And again, it's crazy to think back, but it was just kind of like a shoe tree for your hat. When you're yeah. not wearing your baseball cap, you put it in a perfect curve and it just curves it while you're not wearing it. And uh, it had three different curve options you could uh, choose depending on the, how much curve you want it. So, it, and you know what, it's a crazy, silly product, but you know, the end result is it took two years to develop it, um, you know, to, to get a final design and to get prototypes. And uh, we introduced it three years later, we had sold over 3 million units. So 3 million unit of the, of the perfect curve. Yeah. Within the so first three years. How did you get first get into the game with Perfect Curve? Like what what type of store do you you got Perfect Curve into the small mom and pop shops at first? And then did someone else contact you? Did you reach out to other bigger stores? How did that snowball effect happen? Yeah, it, you, you know, no one contacts you. That, that's a wonderful situation. And I don't know if I've ever been in it, but uh, it's usually you contacting. Um, and again, for us, it was a sporting goods type of related product. Uh, where baseball hats were sold mostly, uh, especially, you know, uh, Major League Baseball, NFL, things like that were in sporting goods stores. So you went to the local stores, you know, in your towns, um, you know, and you just, you, you called or you went there with a the product and said, just give it a try. And you would give them maybe a dozen and say, you don't even have to pay for it. You know, I'll be back in two weeks. And if you sold some, you pay for them. And if you want more, then, you know, we'll start building a relationship. Um, and, and then that's, 
that's what it was about. You just had to be persistent. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, fortunately for us, we did gain some of that early success. Uh, we had some good success with some PR back then, which was, which was real critical. And, you know, I just, I just went after every store I could and, and sent samples and, and, and yep. followed up and it just takes persistence. I do see some, some big similarities between where we are now and what you're describing back then in terms of retail, just not it being in such a, a physical space. Now we have the digital shelf as an example, less people are on the physical shelves, more people are on the digital shelves. And some of the same principles seem to apply. I'll save that later for the conversation though. Let's talk about the continuation of your story. I, I, I wanna throw the cap rack in here because the cap rack is, I mean, Perfect Curve was a huge success. You sold so many units within the first three years. And then there's this cap rack product, right? I'm seeing a theme of, of hats here. And uh, <laughs> the, the hat theme product, I, I love it. The cap rack was an enormous success. I was literally just talking to a guy yesterday about the cap rack and he was like, oh yeah, I have a cap rack. So people are, people have them, people are still buying them. In your story, what, how, how soon after you came out with the perfect curve, how, how soon did you lead into the cap rack? Where does that fit in? Well, you know, the, the big concern is that you're just gonna be a one hit one that you're gonna flame out after that one product and you won't have anything else to you know follow up. And you know, I, I really didn't want that to be my, you know, where my future. Um, so what we did was we reinvested any money that we had uh, from you know selling three million units, which was an incredible feat. I mean, to, to do that in the first three years. Uh, and that generated some revenue. We were able to do some things, but we reinvested in the business. And I knew I wanted to do a cap rock. I wanted to do something great, but I also knew that to do what I wanted, I had to step it up a little bit. I had to go from the Play-Doh to something else. And again, we, we took the money, reinvested it. We hired a fantastic design firm that sat down with me. And I just, I told them, this is what I wanted to be. I wanted to do this, do this, do this, do this. And a, like almost, I believe it was about 25 things I wanted this cap rack to do. And if I remember correctly, they nailed all but one. What was the one? Uh, uh, we, we wanted to be able to not only go horizontal and vertical, but I wanted to go diagonal and it really couldn't do it. Uh, so I, I was fine with that. Um, you know, that was our, that was our first cap rack. Um, we've come out with, you know, lots of different iterations, but I remember when we introduced that one, it was really a battle of the best product. And what I mean by that is the product on the market already were cheaper and held more caps. Mm. So here I was going to marker with a more expensive, holding less caps product, but I was convinced that the market needed something better. And ours was a better solution. Uh, and sure enough, you know, we, we took over that product within a year or two. I mean, retailers realized that the better product was better for their consumers. It was better for their business. It generated more revenue for them. Again, it was more expensive than what they were currently selling. Um, and it was designed and created by a cap accessory company, which we were becoming, but someone who, cared about caps. And, you know, that's, I brought that to, to our business so that this was a market that spoke to me uh, and me as a consumer, this is what I would want, as opposed to a company just bringing out a product that, oh, it can do this and it can hold hats, but it can hold scarves, it can hold ties, it can hold, you know, things like that. This yeah. was a very specific product. How did you decide what would be better? You're, you are a, a cap accessory company, right? But like you said, there were other products that were cheaper, and it's just more accessible. So how did you make it better? How did you differentiate yourself? Our product was the best product for your cap is, is the best way to put it. Um, the other products that we were competing against um, almost kind of misshapened your cap or didn't really give them the respect that a lot of us people who have caps uh, want to give them. And what I mean by that is they just hang on a nail, let's say that creates misshapen hats, things like that. Our product supported the hat from underneath. Um, and that was a, a pretty innovative thing. Um, it just was a better for the cap. Our, our cap rack showed the cap facing forward. So you could see the logo. So if you've got 
you know, 10 or 12 caps of your favorite, you know, sports teams or, you know, your favorite golf courses that you've played over the last 15 years, you know, you see them all in a row. Um, yeah. With the other cap racks, they're all just hanging down with the logos facing the ground. So, you know, ours just was better for the cap and it just was more appreciated, I think, by the consumer because it was, you know, a, a better way to hold all their, their baseball caps and show them yeah. off. If you go on Amazon, you look at the cap rack, it has over 30,000 reviews. That is, review signature is a huge determinant of success, truly. And I did some digging, and Cap Rack has more reviews than any of the Harry Potter books individually. Uh, <laughs> it has that. more reviews than, I think, any of the last iPhones and the newest Apple Watch. So, like, I just, I was playing a comparison game to see just how popular, the Cap Rack is, is, so popular so many people have bought it what would you say were some of the most important factors that led to the crazy success of the cap rack that's a very broad question and you feel free to answer however you like but to you what were the biggest factors that led to its success you know i i think it really comes down to solving a problem plain and simple you know there's a lot of baseball caps out there hundreds of millions of them sold every year uh, men wear them, women wear them, young and old. Uh, and the problem is where to, where to put them and where to store them. And, you know, our, our cap rack, our line of baseball caps solve that problem. You know, give the consumer, you know, a reason that really means something to them that, uh, you know, allows them to, I don't want to say better their life, but, you know, to, to create a pain point that's no longer a pain point hats all over the place, on the floor, in the closet, things like that. And oftentimes it's the simplest things. And, you know, this cap rack isn't complex. There's not a lot of moving parts. It's plastic and it's a little bit of metal, um, but it really solves a, a problem. And I think that's what a lot of people are looking for, whether or not you're buying something at a brick and mortar retail store or, you know, on e-commerce, what's it, how's it gonna solve a problem that I'm having? You solved a problem. There were also other solutions at the time that were solving the problem. And you took that a step further, right? In addition to solving the problem, you you made the solution even better than all the other solutions that were available. And I think that's where sometimes people get stuck is where they see other, like they think perhaps that there needs to be no solutions for this problem. When in fact, there are some solution, solutions that are available, but the solutions maybe aren't that great. So I love the fact that you you even took that a step further. You said, hey, there are some solutions, but they're awful. I'm going to help improve them even better and make people's lives better and help solve this problem even further. I, I would agree. And, and, you know, we still compete. I mean, there are still similar products to ours. That sure. we can against, and there's other cap racks that serve a function for people who need it. You know, their, their caps stored in a different way. So, you know, we're still competing uh, and we're still trying to innovate. And I, I'll, I'll tell you an interesting uh, interesting realization I had, you know, recently, um, you, you mentioned our reviews and, and we're very fortunate. Uh, you know, I think we've got over 30,000 five-star reviews, something like that, but we also have about 1500 one-star reviews and you can't ignore those and, yeah. and you ignore them at your peril. And, you know, I would get these one-star reviews and I would look at them. And in the old days, you could respond to people who had problems. And sometimes it was, you know, packaging related. It arrived, broke, you know, damaged. Well, that's not something that I caused. It's, you know, people have a problem with the product itself. And I would answer them and, you know, try to, you know, explain it. But it gave us an opportunity to say, how can we still do it better? We can't just rely on, on this forever. You know, you've got to listen to the consumer and the consumer's telling you something in those one star reviews. And, you know, I'm happy to say that we listened and, you know, in a couple months, we're going to be introducing, you know, uh, our answer to that, that, that those pain points that our consumers were having uh, with our product. And again, it's just offering a, a, a wider breadth of products to, you know, find a solution for our consumer yeah. that you know, that they enjoy, that they like. So, you know, you, you can learn a lot from, from, from listening to the, to the consumer. When we were, when we initially talked before this interview, when we first met each other, uh, we were talking, we were talking about product innovation and development and how a lot of people nowadays perhaps don't 
automatically move towards creating something new. They maybe move closer to um, finding an existing product and just putting a brand on it and putting it out there, which again, that works. But what I found interesting about your story is that you really focused on innovation. I mean, your first product, for example, Perfect Curve, product innovation, you created something new. So I, I wanna ask you just broadly, could you break down your product innovation philosophy? And a lot of it is keep it simple, stupid. Um, you know, we, <laughs> we, we don't have the big budgets. You know, I'm here 25 years later. Um, you know, we don't have six figures to spend on developing a product. And that's not our philosophy now. Um, you've got to be a lot more nimble. You've got to be, you know, you got to be able to pivot uh, quicker. Uh, we, 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 in the past, we did spend, I think one particular product, we spent about $140,000 designing it with a design firm and all that. Um, and it, it, it didn't work, it died. And, you know, we, I said, you know, I'm not, we don't need to do that model. So now with our company Curve Design Group, our philosophy is really try to get it to market without the big expense, because for us, our products are, are, are organic. We come up with them ourselves for the most part. Um, you know, so we want to try to develop it, do the prototype, do the 3D engineering in-house and see if we can do it for as little as we can. I mean, we, we take pride in how little we can bring a product to market uh, for us internally. And the reality is it's so difficult and the likelihood of success is so small that you can't afford to spend $100,000 five times on five failures. And, you know, you do the best you can, you try to come up with a, a product and there's so many variables. And if one of those is off, you may not achieve enough success. So, you know, we introduced a product two years ago, which was innovative. Um, we spent very little money. I think we spent three to $5,000. It took seven, eight weeks. That was, that's kind of what we do here when we can. And within the first two, three months, it had paid for itself, you know, and it's been profitable ever since. So, you know, that's, that's our philosophy right now. Simple, you know, easy to use, easy to ship, things like that, uh, and bring them to market. Tweak if you have to, and and hope that you succeed. I I'm so curious how how you think through solving problems for people. So I, th my main question, the main question I'm trying to work towards here is, uh, what are the most important factors that go into creating a product that people want to buy? In 25 years, I haven't evolved that far away from that Play-Doh that I started with. You know, the, the process, quite honestly, is what I notice and, you know, what I see is might be, uh, you know, something missing from the marketplace. Yes, our, our company also helps other people that, you know, have ideas that they've come up with. And that's, you know, we love doing that. And that's, that's part of our business. But, you know, for the stuff that we do organically, it really is, you know, something that I think you know, I'd like whatever it is, you know, if you need it, odds are maybe somebody else needs it too. And if you can develop it real simple, get cardboard, get duct tape, get paper clips. I mean, these are all things I still use today yeah. to convey what, you know, you know, the product that's in my, my head, do it and get it to a point and, and see if it still works, you know, create a prototype and Wow, that really did work. So maybe I'll create a little better one. And, and then maybe, oh, I know a friend who knows a friend who can do some 3D design, some CAD, and maybe we can have it 3D printed. You know, it, there's a lot of little steps, but they're not huge steps. You just got to keep making lots of little ones. And that's what we do. I mean, that, that's our philosophy. Uh, I'm curious, looking back over your time, product development, innovation, e-commerce, retail, are there any common threads of success that you see? Uh, I, I'd say, you know, two in particular, one, like you say, is having that product that people relate to. And two, I, I think it comes down to, in a way, you know, me being persistent and, and not giving up. You know, you've you got to have that push for your product and for your idea. Now, that doesn't mean you keep pushing your product when it's failing, because you need to know that, too. You know, we, we've... I, I had a product I went very deep in. We had over 100,000 units. We were very bullish on this product and it didn't work out. 
And I had to liquidate all of it at a tremendous loss. Oh man. Yeah. It's, you know, it was, it, it was tough. And I still think the product's great, you know, but the market just wasn't ready for it. And it, it just, it, it wasn't a success. So, you, you know, you've got to know when to fail. And that's, that's a part of being persistent is that I yeah. want to go to the next thing. I, I gotta, you know, I gotta think ahead. I've got to, I gotta turn this around. Let's go back to perfect curve. The first product you ever created, let's say perfect curve did not do well. If that was the case, how would you, how would you talk to yourself to keep on going, to not give up? I, I think it comes down to really believing in yourself and believing that what you're making is is valid and that this really is an important product. And I remember making a pitch to, at this point, one of those stores that had a, a hundred stores at the time. And the owner, a young kid, my age at the time in his twenties said, this is crazy. You know, this is, <laughs> this is not gonna work. This is ridiculous. And I was like, trust me, the product, you know, it's just too new. You know, this was a revolutionary product, not an evolutionary. No one had seen something like this before. And I said, let's put it in a couple stores. I've got a great display. I'll give you the display for free. You know what? I'll send five free samples to every store for all your employees to try and, you know, do all that and, you know, try to see the marketplace. And sure enough, he called me back two weeks later. He's like, I need more. And, you know, that, that just, you know, uh, evolved and, you know, you, you just, you just stay at it. And I think I tell myself to just keep believing in yourself and yeah. taking those little steps as, as far as you can. Yes. At some point, something's going to stop you. And I look back now, I don't sell that first product anymore. We stopped selling that about 10, 12 years ago wow. because the market, the market changed. Baseball caps came pre-curve. And that was huge. I had to, I had to look at my sales and say, it's just not worth it. Keep going, try the next thing. Don't give up and just stay at it. Persistence. What are some of the biggest things or what's the biggest thing, the biggest change that you think that you see happening over the next three to five years in e-commerce or retail? I think brick and mortars are, are, are going to still have to really try to figure out what their reason for, for existence is. And I say that because I think they need to be there. I think that there is a reason for you to go to a store and see something, try something, feel something. I, I do think that exists. You know, I do think e-commerce is, is going to continue to explode. I do think Amazon is going to get competition. I think that's going to uh, continue. I, you know, they're the 800 pound gorilla right now, but just like we've seen in history, you know, those other guys are going to catch up. They may not reach you know, Amazon, but they're going to start clipping at the heels and giving themselves a reason to, to exist and relevancy to companies like myself, you know, so I think that's going to change as well. Hopefully I'm hopeful that more small companies and people like myself who can bring an innovative idea, not just a big company that's going to bring, you know, a, a lower price, you know, knockoff or, you know, another mousetrap, but something new and innovative that comes from, you know, just regular consumer consumers, yeah. you know, hopefully they'll start bringing, you know, their products to market. And, you know, and Amazon is a great equalizer that way, you know, for 40 bucks, anybody can get on and sell something. Now that doesn't mean you're going to have success as soon as you bring a product. And that's quite honestly where, you know, Techometrics has been so important to us is, you know, you still have to do the hard work, but, it, it, hopefully it's going to be that platform where more great ideas and ingenuity uh, are going to evolve. And I'm hopeful, you know, so that, that's where, that's where I kind of see it. Final question. And before I ask, I just want to say thank you, Greg, so much for, for coming on. Thank you so much for, for talking about your story, for talking about it, your advice that you give to people. You have amazing perspective, amazing success. You've been through a lot to get to where you are now. And I love talking about product innovation, product development. How can people connect with you, with your design company? If people want to learn more about you or just find you, how can they do that besides going on Amazon and buying a cap rack? <laughs> the, the best way right now is our company called Curve Design Group. And, and that is us, you know, taking 20, 25 years of experience and just trying to help people who have ideas, bring them to market. Um, and that, you know, quite honestly don't have, huge budgets that you know may have more simpler products we're not going to create the next iWatch. that's not what our company does but you know if you have an idea you know you know curve design group 
you know, we can, we can look at it. We can see if we can help you, whether it's, you know, full on design or just design tweaking, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's logistics, uh, distribution, things like that. So per design group, uh, is probably the best way to get us. Um, and you know, we're, we're just big supporters of people with ideas. Greg, thank you so much again for being here. I'm really looking forward to talking more, having more conversations in the future. Thanks again. Looking forward to it. Thanks, Cameron. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you got as much out of that as I did. It was incredible to talk with Greg about product development, his philosophy on innovation, on creating a product that people want to buy, and so much more. If you have any questions for Greg, put them in the comments below. I'll be relaying all these comments to him, and I'll be moderating the comments as well. And if you enjoyed this episode, consider subscribing to our YouTube channel to keep up to date with everything that we're up to and to keep up to date with all the brand stories that are on their way. Thanks for joining me here at Take a Metrics. I'll see you soon.